good afternoon and happy Sabbath to you all. And thank you, Tommy and Jordan for leading out in the preliminaries. So I hope you all have been enjoying this gorgeous and lovely weather. Um, it's definitely nice to see that the, and feel that the weather is um, warming up. And I hope you're loving it and getting some fresh air and some good old vitamin D. So another month is here. So that means that it's Youth Forum. So this is the opportunity for you to ask um, and anyone to ask their questions on this topic. And don't feel don't feel that you have to be shy. Feel um, free to ask your question and you can put them in the chat. Um, you can send myself a text or even wait until the Q&A portion to um, ask your question by unmuting. And just as a reminder, as it says on the screen, this afternoon's AY um, will be recorded, but don't let that hinder you from or stop you from asking your question. So tonight's, not tonight, today's question is, um, am I too unworthy to come to God? And some of us may be giving a resounding no, like no, but can you explain why? Um, can you give um, hope and um, solace to someone um, who feels that they really can't come to God? Can you give an answer to that? And we'll be exploring that question tonight um, and it will be answered by my fake cousin, <laughs> Brother Andrew Barrett, and he isn't a stranger to community. Um, he's a young man who enjoys dissecting the word and explaining things on a practical level. Um, and he really gets hyped up and excited when he um, shares the word and it's very infectious. And it comes across like kind of like a modern Dame James, um, but he doesn't come at your neck like James does. Um, it's not as harsh. Um, but I do encourage everyone to take notes um, as Professor Barrett pulls up and shares the word of God. And um, as we answer the question, am I too unworthy to come to God? So um, I know it's brief, but I just want to give ample time um, to Andrew. So I now turn it over to you, Andrew. Um, and we pray that the Holy Spirit guides you as you share with us. Amen. 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 Pardon my um, my whereabouts, my howabouts. Um, I'm not in my home, so I have to make do with what I have. Hopefully, it's not awkward looking. Maybe I could you know, close this real quick. But yeah, it is what it is. We don't need the word of God is not bound. The Bible says, you know, wherever we are, however we are, um, we can still speak by God's grace. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here, Katie Ann. I don't know how you dissed our, our family ship like that. Um, we're not fake cousins. We, we are a real family. Um, you have my name for a reason. Tommy, I'm liking that shirt. Looking real dapper there, brother. Um, Sister JT, thank you for that introduction. Um, I want to give a shout out and appreciation to every single person with their cameras on. I think it'd be super awkward if I spoke like this. Um, it'll just be awkward. And it's kind of as awkward to listen like this too. But but I'm gonna give you guys some slack, you know, um, I don't want to be annoying. But by God's grace, I hope that, you know, we can, as we spend some time in the word, we can um, listen as God says something to us, because I think God is dying to speak to us. And I wonder if we are dying to listen. I'm just going to say a prayer real quick. And um, then I guess we'll get right into it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your love and kindness, your mercy, your faithfulness. Thank you, dear God, that where we are weak, then you are strong. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that you use the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise and the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may even use me. Um, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may speak through me that you may hide me, that I may be invisible and that Christ may be seen. I pray that through this discussion, God, that if anybody has anything burning on their heart, that you'd give them boldness to ask and that you'd give me clarity to address. Dear God, I really believe that desperately, even now, dear Lord, we need to hear your voice. We need to hear your voice, dear Lord. We need signal manifestations of your presence and your power. So be with us, I pray. Um, we love you and we appreciate you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And so I was given a couple of questions that 
I guess I'm responsible to kind of lead out a discussion on. Um, see, here's the thing. I know that a lot of times we want to have discussions, but a lot of times people are too shy, you know? So it's like, I would much rather prefer get into a discussion where we're talking and we're kind of, you know, um, rapping about certain things. But I also do know that no matter what, like I can ask questions, but a lot of people are just too shy to even comment. And so I'll definitely, you know, open the floor many times to see if anybody has any thoughts to share. Um, but if not, then we definitely could dive through the Bible. Um, the first question, the first question is, can you give some of us or can you give some individuals in the Bible who may have had feelings of unworthiness? And before I talk about that, I just want to kind of ask you guys, um, do you have anybody in the Bible that may have seemed unworthy? And maybe we can dissect each of those instances. But yeah, anybody, does anybody come to your mind when we think about anybody in the Bible who may have felt unworthy? Anyone? I'll jump in and say Moses. Moses, cool. Why do you say Moses? Let's look it up. We, so we have our Bibles. I, I don't intend to quote unquote preach. I intend for us to kind of discuss and really dive into the Bible. And so why do you say Moses? How, where can I go to kind of, maybe if you Google something, where can I go to kind of get an idea of how Moses felt he was unworthy? Um, well, Exodus, I'm pulling it up now. I want to say somewhere five, six, or seven. Let's see. Yeah. And yeah, everybody, like, cool. I think a blessing of being on Zoom is y'all are on your computers, your phones. Like, hey, pull out your phones and Google something. Pull out your laptops and Google something. Hey, I think I remember that one verse, that one time in that one place. Google it. You know, say something. Maybe we can help you find it kind of a thing. There's, there's no shame in that. But yeah, sorry, Kidian. Yeah, Exodus 4, actually, 4, verse 10, where it's when Moses says to the Lord, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Um, I felt like he felt unworthy to do what the Lord required of him. Um, now, so that's why I mentioned. Now, question. Why do you think he felt unworthy? I mean, he, he said he was giving the excuse that he was slow of speech. He felt like his, um, the, the faculties that he had, the abilities that he had were not um, to the standard that God wanted him to, that he would, he perceived God wanted him to um, speak to the people of Israel or go to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Diamond said lack of confidence. Um, for sure. I think it's, it's powerful because yeah, these are a part of the reasons why we feel sometimes like we are not fit, you know, like we're unworthy or not enough or whatever it may be to do something for God. And the question is, is that a justifiable reason? I mean, to me, it's a justifiable reason. Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I had like a stammering tongue or a lisp or something and I was, you know, ashamed of that for some reason or, or embarrassed of that, I'm just going to go out there and preach with boldness. Nah, you know, if I, if I felt like there was, you know, if I lacked confidence, like these are all good reasons, you know what I mean? And so the first thing I want us to kind of meditate upon is, hey, like in and of ourselves, we definitely are unworthy. In and of ourselves, we are not perfect. In and of ourselves, we're not the ones, <laughs> you know, like if I was God and I had an opportunity to choose the best person or the best entity to carry out this work. I don't know that I would choose me if I was looking for someone that was the best. But here's the powerful thing. God doesn't operate how we operate. And a lot of times it's simple. It's a very simple thing, man, but it's something that, that, that we often overlook. God does not want someone that does not feel a little bit of, hmm, am I worthy enough? And that's real talk. That's point number one. If you feel sufficient enough yourself, if you feel like, yeah, God, like I'm the one, <laughs> you know, like don't pick anybody else. You already know I'm the man for the job. It's like, hmm, usually those types of a people are the ones that fail. And here's the thing, right? Moses at that time wasn't anything. I don't think he was worthy. I don't think he was any of that. 
As a matter of fact, to prepare him, God had to put him in the wilderness for 40 years. And so I think that that one, the first after that first point is, is to be uncomfortable in your unworthiness. Be like, be uncomfortable in your unworthiness. But then at the same time, here's the catch. Be comfortable in it too. And somebody's like, wait, what? What are you even saying? Here's the thing. This work is spiritual. And a lot of times we actually don't take that in. But like, this is a spiritual thing. Like, your worthiness, your unworthiness does not come from you. Like, when you look to yourself, you should feel unworthy. And guess what? That should make you feel uncomfortable. But you should know that Christ came into this world to work with those that he believed are unworthy. He literally says, you know, I did not come to those that are whole. I did not come to those that didn't need help. I came to those that needed a physician, those that needed some help, those that seen their unworthiness. And so as you look to yourself, it's like, hmm, only looking at myself, I'm unworthy and I'm uncomfortable in that. But looking at Christ with myself, I now embrace the fact that this is deeper than me. Like this wasn't ever about you. This wasn't about whether or not you could speak or you couldn't speak. This wasn't about whether or not you were smart or you were stupid. Like this wasn't about that. You know, this is always only about God. And God's power is made known and made manifest um, better in the weakest of things. Let's look real quick. We're in Exodus 4. We're in Exodus 4. You brought us to Exodus 4, Katie Ann. But let's start all the way at the top. Let's start all the way at the top. And does somebody want to read just, you know, 1 to verse 4? Anyone? And Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken unto my voice. For they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, on the ground, and it became a, a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. Pause, and hold, the on, Lord... hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, here's the powerful thing. This is what God asks us. He just says, Hey, what's in your hand? What's in your hand? What's in your hand? Jillian, what's in your hand? Diamond, what's in your hand? And in a certain sense, what's in our hand is what's in our possession. What are the skills in your possession? What are the resources in your possession? What are the supports in your possession? Who are the people in your possession? Who's in your corner? Who are you? What is in your possession? What is in your hand? And Moses says, just a piece of wood. I got a rod. And God's just like, yeah, I expected you to say that. Now cast it to the ground. And what does it become? It becomes a whole living creature. Which shows what is in your hand is just a piece of nothing. But that very same thing combined with the power of God becomes life. Becomes literally whatever it needs to become. And the powerful thing about that rod is, is, is when you take it in, it's like that rod wasn't a serpent. It was just a stupid rod. You can pick up, you, you can find rods anywhere. But with God, that rod can split a sea. That rod can turn waters to blood. That rod can become a serpent. Like that rod can be anything that God needs for you to be or for it to be for any circumstance. So therefore, if I say I'm unworthy, sure, what is in my possession is not enough. It's just this. It's just that. It's not this. It's not that. God is like, all right, yeah, cast it to the ground now. Let's see what's good. Let, let's see what it could turn into. Let's see what it can turn into. And so with that perspective in mind, like what excuse do we have? What excuse? God is saying, all right, show me anything. Show me anything. Sh show me a rod. Show me a stick. Show me anything. Or anything. And when I tell you to cast it to the ground, you'll see what that thing that you thought was nothing can become. 
And you know what's so powerful? Here's the powerful thing. Here's the powerful thing. Here's the powerful thing. Moses takes what was in his possession. Proverbially, let's say symbolically, that was one of his skills. Let's say his skill of speaking. That's in his possession, right? We're, we're going deeper here. We're thinking about this in an abstract way. We're applying the Bible in a spiritual or symbolic way. So that was in his possession. That rod can represent his ability to speak, right? Now, now his ability to speak is trash. It's not good. He stammers. If you're picking a man to do your keynote sermon, you know, and he had a bad stammer, like, I don't know if he would be the one. But here's the thing. That's when you evaluate him just on his own. Moses then takes the rod in his hand, what was in his possession, his stammering tongue. And God says, release that and let me use it. He releases it and lets God use it. And that tongue now becomes whatever God needs for it to be. Whether it stammers or not, it begins to speak to your heart. Whether it stammers or not, it says things that hit you to your core. Whether it stammers or not, has an accent or not, has no you know, eloquent words or not, God still uses that to speak directly to your soul. And guess what, what happens now? Look at what happened to Moses. The Bible says that when Moses seen it, Tommy, what, what happened to Moses? He fled. He got afraid. He's like, a lie. <laughs> what, what in the world? He's like, what's that? <laughs> He's like, that wasn't in my hand. <laughs> That's not what was in my hand. A rod was in my hand. But now it's, something, it's a whole different, it's a whole animal. <laughs> and so it's powerful that, that God can use things that you had in your hand in ways that will get you afraid. You'll be like, mm, I never knew that was, I never knew that was what it was, God. I never, I, I just looked at it as a stammering tongue. I just looked at it as a rod. God's just like, hey, I can use, pivotal point here, don't sleep on this point. God is saying, I can use what you think you have, what you have that you think is nothing to be so powerful that it'll make you afraid. Like, take that in. God is saying, what you have, whatever skill, talent, anything, that is just a meager talent. that you don't think is much. God can use that very same thing and bring life to it. A rod is just a dead piece of stick until God turns it into a serpent where it's moving, it has life. God can give life to your talents that you think are nothing. Even in such a way that it'll bring you fear. And then watch what happens now. Watch the next verse. God says to, to Moses, pick it up, right? But he doesn't just say, pick it up, though. He says, pick it up from where? Come on, somebody tell me, y'all are leaving me alone right now. I feel lonely right now. Pick it up from the tail. Huh? Question. Who in their right mind will pick up a serpent from the tail? Anybody that has sense knows if you're if you're trying to catch a snake, where are you trying to catch it from? The head. The head. <laughs> you're trying to crush the head top. You're not trying to go for the tail because what's going to happen if you go for the tail? <laughs> you so on you on bite you. <laughs> hey. Okay. So it's like picking it up from the tail is like even that in of itself. It's kind of like man, like ah. But in so doing, it's like you step out of your comfort zone and, and when you do what God tells you to do, you need not fear. You know? And so I think that that a, a powerful thing about feeling unworthy is, is sure, sure, fine. The more you look to yourself, yeah, you should feel unworthy. But this is a spiritual thing. This is not physical. This is not earthly. This is spiritual. Like God is a real person. Like he, he, you don't see him right now. He's a spiritual being. He's not confined to time as you know it. He's not confined to the, 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 your abilities. He's not confined to what you think is possible or not possible. Like God is not confined. Therefore, whatsoever you have, whether it's good or bad, enough or not enough, when you give it to God, God will use that very same thing and give life to it in ways that will even make you afraid. Give me another person in the Bible that felt kind of unworthy or 
felt like, you know, they were, they were not enough to serve God in the church. Give me someone else. Come on, guys, talk to me, talk to me. I got a text. Um, two people, Jonah and possibly Peter. Are those mm. two mm. Peter, give me an example of Peter. Let me, where should I flip in the Bible to see that one? Uh, John. Love it, I love it. John what? John 39. Yes, yes, John 13, 9. Y'all are taking me to a Bible, through a Bible study right now. I love it. John 13, 9. Okay, can somebody break this down to me? What, what, how do we see that Peter felt like he was, un, he was unworthy here? What, where should I read? Let me, let, I'm at your service. Tell me what I should read. John 13, 9 alone, that's it? Okay, I'll, I'll read it, then break it down to me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, don't wash my feet only, but also my hands and, and my head. And in this, how did Peter show that he felt he was unworthy? Somebody talk to me. You guys don't get shy on me. I'm feeling lonely right now. In essence, he was saying that he was like, fully unclean like not just his feet but like his entire body like just covered in i guess sin like he just felt dirty and unworthy yeah 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 now was he dirty was he dirty i want to if you if you can allow me i want to build on this i want i want us to put our ideas together let's go to luke real quick luke 5 luke 5 Luke 5, and, and let's read verse 8. Can can the sister that just said that, can you read Luke 5 and verse 8? When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Depart from me, I'm a sinful man. Was he, did he need washing totally? We all need washing. We're all dirty. We're all sinful beings so yeah let me ask you a question now tyler richardson i know that's not your name but you know that is my um, name it is okay <laughs> praise god praise god praise god um <laughs> actually yeah tyler is a unisex name it's actually a really nice name um forgive me for that um so let me ask you a question peter when he made mistakes why do you think he what was the root of the mistakes that he made and i know it's kind of a maybe hard question but like let me ask it in a simpler way. Why do you think, give an example of a mistake Peter made. Peter, well, Peter was the hothead, right? Like the mm -hmm. angry one. Yeah. So um, when, I don't think it happened. It didn't happen before this, but I guess after when, um, well, first of all, he also denied Jesus, but that was all. But say less. <laughs> say less. No, but I was also going to say when, you know, he took the sword and, um, the, when they were taking Jesus after the Garden of Gethsemane, and he took this, that was Peter, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah Everyone's looking yeah. at me like I'm wrong. No, 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 that was Peter. <laughs> sword and like um, cut the guy's ear. So, yeah. Let me ask you a question. What do you think was the foundation of a lot of Peter's mistakes? The found well, this may seem like a very general answer, but I think the foundation of it is well, I won't just say sin because obviously that's the foundation, but I think self and also the the lack of denial of self because if we mm. just rely on our our nature that's what i'll say his human nature so his nature was to be angry at times like he was a hothead he was not slow to anger he was very quick to anger so i guess the um the lack of temperance the lack of like i said denying of self was the root of a lot of his mistakes i would say it's crazy because in verse eight here peter says depart from me for i'm a sinful man O lord do you feel like Peter always felt like he was a sinful man? I feel like Peter was feeling himself way too much sometimes. I feel like Peter thought that he was, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was asking if you were still asking me if that was a question. For oh, anyone, anyone. But yeah, no, Tyler, if you, praise God, like if you, if you want to add to that for sure. But I think that Peter oftentimes, his problem was that he didn't really see himself as a sinful man. He boasted, hey, who shall be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Me? Lord, everybody's going to deny you. I ain't going to deny you. What? 
no. And what happens? He denies Christ, right? Okay, so in a certain sense, Peter's fault, Peter's problem came from the fact that he didn't keep the fact that he was a sinful man ever before him. And the more Peter would think highly of himself, the more he would fail. Now, let me ask you guys a question. Um, I love to give this example. I'm just going to rip through it. It's going to take me like two minutes. And so I really want to rip through it real quick. Um, what was the sign God gave to Peter? What was the sign God gave or what was the sign Christ gave to Peter that would show Peter that he actually denied Jesus? What was that sign? The rooster crowing. Okay. The cock would crow, right? Okay. Now, question. Um, uh, uh, I love to speak about this and, and there's something called a psychological cue. And all a psychological cue is, is something that happens, maybe something involving your senses, what you see, touch, smell, taste, whatever, you know, that reminds you of something, right? So if I smell a certain thing, it's like, oh man, I really remember that smell from like my mother's cooking. It reminds me of home, you know, or I ate some food one time and it made me feel super sick. Therefore, now I can't even eat spaghetti anymore because I ate spaghetti two years ago and I almost died. Like these things are cues, right? Every time you hear a certain, you know, tune, it's like, oh, snap. I remember, you know, that song. I remember the person and the thing that that song reminds me of. Like these things are psychological cues. Stay with me real quick. Um, um, what was, what would you say was Peter's psychological cue that was associated with him denying Jesus? The rooster crow. The rooster crying, right? So so Jesus didn't just say, okay, yeah, you're going to deny me and then you're going to realize it. He's going to say, he said, no, you're going to realize it when the rooster crows. The rooster crowing was indelibly impressed upon Peter's mind and associated with him denying Jesus. Now, let me ask you guys a question. How often do roosters crow? Jeez, how often do roosters go? Every morning. Every morning. Every morning. Now, how? When in the morning? Nice and nice when you wake up. Does the rooster say, "Hey, when you wake up, tell me so I can I can grow"? No. Early in the morning. They start about three o'clock. Early. Now, question. Just imagine, Peter. Sometimes rooster crowings wake you up. Somebody from Yad, tell me if I'm lying. Sometimes a rooster can crow and it can wake you up, no? That's the purpose of them crowing, to wake you up. Jeez. So, hold on. So, do you mean to tell me every morning Peter woke up and heard the very thing that was associated with him denying Jesus? But here's the powerful thing, though. He needed that. He needed that. And some of us need that. Peter needs to be reminded of his own unworthiness, so to speak. Because some of us are feeling ourselves way too much. I heard the saying once that said, the gospel comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comforted. And so in, in a certain sense, our unworthiness or feeling like we're not enough or whatever is a good thing. To the extent that some of us need to be reminded of that. Because our sufficiency is not of self, it's of Christ. It's of Christ. If it was of us, it would have been a wrap. If it was of me, jeez. Why? <laughs> it can't be of me. I need to be reminded that it's not of me. I need to be reminded to take my eyes off of myself. And put my eyes on Jesus. And guess what? The manifestation of this was that Peter was humbled. Even to the extent that the story is told when they wanted to crucify him. He asked him, can you crucify me upside down? Because I'm not even worthy to be crucified like Christ was crucified. This is a mark of conversion. A man that doesn't boastfully come to Christ. Christ doesn't want you in your perfection. He wants you in all of your mess. And all of that. And all of your insufficiencies and in your imperfections. That's how he wants you. That's how he wants you. Real quick, give me, give me some more people. Give me some more people. Um, 
maybe we can go on to the next question because I realize we, we're supposed to get to these questions. Um, but real quick, there was Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah said, you know, um, in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1, I think, we're not going to go there because we don't have time to go to every Bible text. But Jeremiah said, God, I can't speak for, for like, I'm just a child. Put that in, in, in your notes if you're, if you're taking notes. People do that still. Jeremiah 1, you could look that up. Jeremiah literally said, God, I can't speak for I'm but a child. So in a certain sense, his lack of experience, some of us are children in the word, babies in the word. And, and tell me, tell me I, 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 I'm not telling the truth. You feel like because you are a mere child in the word, you cannot speak for God. Man, let's go to that Jeremiah one real quick. Jeremiah one, because this one, I, I see this one a lot. I see this one a lot, a lot, a lot. And so Jeremiah one real quick. So we just talked about the person that maybe feels like they know all of their Bible, you know, left, right, up, down, you know, all around. The person that is feeling themselves. Sometimes they need to be remembered that, hey, you're not that. You're, you're not that you're not you're not that sick <laughs> you know you're not that sick take your eyes off of yourself and put your eyes on christ and then now this is for the person that that knows like yo i already know i'm not i, I ain't nothing i don't even i barely even know my bible a lot of a lot of seventh day adventists if somebody questioned them on what they believed they would leave they couldn't, they, they couldn't give a sound explanation. They would just leave and run away. You know, somebody asks you, why do you believe what you believe as a Seventh-day Adventist? Why? A lot, and this is just my experience, I see a lot of people that don't, that don't feel comfortable. You know, and, and praise God, sister. Praise God. I have a whole book on down to chapter two. I, sh I should send you that. There's a lot of resources on prophecy that is powerful. I went to Arizona to speak in, in uh, Arizona State, and there's this Muslim guy, and I was talking all about prophecy. And he would, um, we're, we're, we're in Jeremiah 1, sorry. But he would, he would often, like, taunt the Christian groups on campus. Be like, Yo, guys, G tell, me, tell me where in the Bible Jesus said he was God. Tell me in the Bible. And he tries to come with these aggressive taunts. And I'm just like, Yo, bro. Come to this Bible study. <laughs> this Bible study. <laughs> you know, I'm like, bro, come to this Bible study. And he came to the presentation. And I pretty much spoke about how, see, another thing that the Muslims try to say is that the Bible is like, oh, there's so many different versions and it's, it can't be trusted and all that nonsense. So the man came to the, to the, to the studies, um, to the presentations. And I pretty much just was just showing how Bible prophecy, the Bible is the only book that has the in-depth, comprehensive, prophetic te like teachings that show thousands of years of information before it even happens. And these things can be confirmed by secular history. I'm here breaking it down. I'm like, hey, bro, like, how was it? The man said, uh, I'm like, do you believe? He's like, uh, I don't believe it, but I accept it. I'm like, I don't even know what that means. Anyways, two twos. I left Arizona, me and my friend. One of the Christian persons from the groups that we kept in contact with. We actually heard that that man became a Christian. Prophecy is powerful. But you know how I started, sis? I'll listen to sermons. I'll take notes on the sermons I'll listen to. I had a little Bible study at my house. And I'd say the exact same thing from the sermon I listened to. <laughs> You'll see it there. I'm here breaking out a Bible study like this is my Bible study. <laughs> this is Dwayne Lemon's Bible study or someone else's. It's not my Bible study. <laughs> you feel me? <laughs> oh man, that was deep. That was yeah, I know it was deep, right? It's the same thing I, I thought when I when I seen it, when I heard it. But guess what though? You know, in Ecclesiastes 11, verse 1, the Bible says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days, <laughs> she said, plagiarism, you'll find it again. <laughs> after many days, you yourself will find it again. As you preach, as you teach, you yourself learn. I mean, we all heard it said before by the super excited preacher. God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. But you see, we don't believe that, though. We just make man's come week after week to talk all, talk all this 
everything. And we don't believe it though. We don't believe it. You heard that saying before, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies who he calls. But you don't believe that though. Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah chapter 1. Um, we're going to start in verse number 4. The Bible says, Then the word of the Lord came unto Tyler, saying, Then the word came unto Kadian, and to Tommy, and to Jillian, and to Kashana, and to JT, to Brother Ivor, to Diamond, to everybody, to everybody, and said, Before I formed you in the belly, yeah, I knew you. Before you even came out of the womb, I sanctified you. I ordained you a messenger, a prophet unto the nations. Then I said, ah, Lord God, behold, I can't speak. I'm a baby in the word. Do you know that, that in the Bible, being a child or eating or drinking milk spiritually is likened unto a person that's immature in the Bible. And so Jeremiah, in a sense, when he says, I am a child, can be likened unto us when we feel like we're babies in the word of God. And what, what does God say? Verse 7, But the Lord said unto me, Say not that I am a child, for you shall go to all that I shall send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. And the end. Verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Do you believe that? In all of my studying of the Bible, real quick, in all of my stu studying of the Bible, we're going to go to question number two after this. In all of my studying of the Bible, I one time I went downtown Toronto, and I'm just like, you know, I'm just going to try go fishing today. And he said, what do you mean you go fishing? I'm just trying to, literally, I just went with my camera to see if I can talk to someone and reap someone or something. You know, I just had a little video camera. I'm like, I'm just going to ask random people on the street Hey, do you know what day the Sabbath is? Just try to be a little provocative and see if I can strike up a conversation with anyone, you know? Anyways, I go downtown Toronto, front and center. Craziness is happening. Um, there's a little corner where you have a whole bunch of street preachers. You have Hebrew Israelites. You have Sunday church mans. You have Muslims. You have everybody. You have magicians. People are dancing, acting a fool. Everything. It's actually crazy. One time we were, we were at the same corner on Carabana. Um, yes, yes. Um, on Caravana and we're, I was preaching, um, just kind of like street preaching and we're like handing out stuff. Caravana, you know, front and center craziness happening. And we left and literally a minute after we left, the place got shot up. Craziness was happening. Anyways, I went down there and I had my video camera and I said to, um, I just joined this conversation where these guys were talking about God or whatever. And it seemed like this guy was like bashing Adventists. Now, obviously, I was, I was just there as a FBI agent. Like nobody knows who I am, what I'm there for, you know. And I heard this guy kind of bashing Adventists. I'm like, oh wow, it's like the irony. This is interesting. Anyways, I'm just like, oh wow, you know, this guy's like, uh, he was talking about the millennium, you know, the the thousand years, and he's saying, oh, Seventh Day Adventists believe some some craziness about that. I'm like, oh, what do you believe? He's like, oh, I believe blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, can we look at that in the Bible? And he's just like, no, we don't, no. I'm just like, all right, let's just go to the Bible real quick. The man is telling me, no, like I already know what the Bible says. I'm like, okay, can I see what the Bible says? Let's go, Revelation 20 right now, let's go, boom. We open up the Bible and literally, I just read and explain my point. And there's a neutral guy and he's like, bro, that makes sense. And I'm like, I'm actually 70 of minutes. Yo, the guy, the guy that was bashing at Venice, he looked so embarrassed. Anyways, here's what happened. The same guy that looked that that's like, bro, that made sense. He literally asked me, he's like, yo, can we go across the street and have a Bible study? I'm like, yeah, we go across the street. We sit down. He's like, hey, I've been listening to Walter White. I'm like, oh, snap. All right. <laughs> you know, he's like, man, I really like what the Seventh-day Adventists believe about Bible prophecy. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, he's like, but there's this one thing though, um, in Revelation 11 that I don't really agree with. When I read, um, uh, what Seventh Day Adventists believe about this, I'm like, okay, like what you believe, and I'm not going to get into it right now because I don't want to divert. But he mentioned something that honestly, he said something in a way that I didn't ever look at it like that before. And so when a man said that, I'm like, oh, stop, I actually. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, this is what's happening in my mind right now, but I can't do that. I have to flex. I have to make it seem like I know what I'm talking about. So I'm like, God, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. <laughs> Legit, I promise you, I don't know the answer. I'm like, all right, let's just do this. I'm like, bro, let's just read this and it'll be super clear. <laughs> so I start, the, the man's question is in like in verse, I don't know, like 17 or something. I'm like, let's just start from like verse one and just read it clearly and see. <laughs> I'm going to try to buy my time like God come through because I don't know how I'm going to explain this, but hopefully it makes some sense. I promise you, I literally felt like God sent his angel and took a thought and just put it in my mind. Literally just had a thought and put it in my mind. And it was a Bible verse. What? When I, I don't want to say heard, when I felt, I don't know. I'm just like, oh, snap. I'm like, bro, turn to this verse real quick. We turned to the verse. I explained it. And the man's like, that makes so much sense. And so here I am. I did not have the answer. The, the sufficiency was not of me. I was just in a situation. I made myself available and I felt God, I don't know what to do from here still. <laughs> and I believe that he put his words in my mouth. That same guy followed me on the subway, skipped his stop, came to my stop. That same guy's a Seventh-day Adventist today. It's, it's not about us. Talking about Jonah, Jonah, somebody real quick, before we move to question two, I don't even know if we're going to get to question two. Um, talk to me about Jonah, Jonah. Who, who mentioned Jonah? Can, can you bring me to the Bible verse so I can learn, um, so we can talk about this? How did Jonah feel that he was not worthy? Just by his actions. He actually um, went elsewhere. Took mm. a, not just said he wasn't going, but took a, a boat oh, really? in a whole nother direction. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, that's crazy. Why do you think Jonah did that? I have a question though. Do you think that that was him feeling unworthy, or was that just him being stubborn because mm -hmm. he just didn't want to go talk to them people? So I don't, I don't think that that's personally him feeling unworthy. I mean, hard-headed and stubborn, definitely, but I didn't get unworthy from that. I think he was scared of um, like the word that God sent him to say. So he was scared to tell the people that God said that, you know, a flood was going to, I think a flood was going to come to them and destroy them mm. um, because of their wicked ways. Mm. So it was just that, I guess he didn't want to send a, a, send them a bad message. I honestly can relate to that because the church is, is a very interesting place. You know, the church wants to, the church says amen to things that, that they agree with. But when, when God calls you to say things that are uncomfortable, um, the church can, can be a very mean place. It can be a very hostile place. And I think that, that in one sense, it's like, yeah, Nobody, nobody just naturally, I mean, some people, some people just take delight in, in telling you about yourself, you know, but I don't think that that's natural for a lot of people to just feel comfortable in saying things that are hard to say, you know, and, and here's the thing, the book of Jonah ends in a way that like is so confusing to me. No, I took it out from the insurance thing, right? And it's, it's 235. Okay. Um, I think that that in Jonah's case, to be unworthy, to feel like God, I don't know if this is for me, um, is okay. It's okay. And guess what? If you have to run, then run. And the end. The end. Just run. Okay, I feel unworthy. Like, let's not make it complicated. I feel unworthy. I don't feel comfortable saying, all right, don't say it. Run. 
run. But but are we prepared? So the running is fine, but are we prepared? Or first of all, recognize that we're the one causing the disruption in the in the water. And then second of all, you know you were sent, you know you're the cause for it. So then throw me overboard. So running is not the problem, is that are we willing to take the consequence of our running? Powerful. And guess what? Whether we're willing or not, we're gonna eat the fruit. <laughs> whether we're willing or not, you run, you're going to bear it. And, and here's the powerful thing about God. Um, God understands our fears, man. He understands our fears. He understands our weaknesses. And in Jonah's case, he understood. He can see through what looks like stubbornness. He can see through what looks like a hard heart. He can see through what looks like, as Ellen White says, a rough exterior. He can see through that. And guess what? The more you run, God will bring you back. And I think that that's totally different from somebody doing something for a nefarious purpose. Like, like if, if Jonah was bold to just like speak aggressively to God's people, um, and God didn't bid him to speak that way, God would have punished him. And that's the same thing that happened with Moses. God's like, Moses, speak to the rock. Moses strikes it. And God literally says to Moses, like, you literally unsanctified me in the eyes of the people. Like, do you know who these people are to me? That's the apple of my whole eye. And then there's some people that speak smooth things to the people when God tells them not to. And I think that makes God upset as well. But when you're kind of just trying to address things in fear, um, embrace that fear, man. Like, I think one of our biggest problems is that we're afraid of fear. But why? Why? Like, embrace it. Okay, I'm afraid. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay. It's okay. But ask yourself, why do I feel afraid? Why? And here's the thing. Fear is an emotion, right? And, and really, there's two ways people can cope, either emotion, emotionally, or, you know, they, they, in psychological literature, they have emotion-focused coping and problem-focused coping. And when you're coping in this emotional way, you're not thinking about things logically and practically. And so if you're thinking about being in your fear and it's kind of just like making you not really analyze things as they are, then, of course, like, your, your outcomes aren't going to be good. But well, here's the thing, if you could understand that fear is just an emotion, and if you could evaluate that like you evaluate anything else, then guess what? Fear can literally have no more hold on you. I remember um, back in the day, I used to work with this deliverance ministry. It was called the deliverance ministry. The man would cast out demons. That's what their, that's what their ministry was. They were dopey conquerors, you know, <laughs> that's what they were. And I remember one time when I just was ripe in the faith, I was just trying to, you know, get serious and all of that. And man, um, I started to go out with this ministry. And I remember one time um, we seen this, this woman and we were performing a, what a person would say exorcism, you know, but what just a deliverance, you know. Um, and we we're there and I'm here reading my Bible and I'm just like, yo, really? Literally a couple of months ago, I had a full scholarship. Um, I was a sophomore. I could have transferred to Syracuse. I was about to go, you know, to Europe, like just a couple of months ago. I literally walked away from that. Now I find myself in a basement with a woman that's demon possessed. She's like vomiting and talking in tongues. What? Anyways, two twos. We're in there for hours and I'm just like, all right. Is this, like, is this woman actually really like, this woman's demon possessed, bro? Two twos. I look at the lady and I'm just looking at her like, what has my life come to? Like, where am I right now? And I look at the lady. And the lady looks at everyone in the room. We had like a little circle around her. We were reading and praying and singing. And she looks at me in my eyes. And I'm just looking at this lady. And I promise you, I was not afraid. But the lady looks at me 
for too long. <laughs> and she says to me, she said, you're afraid. And I promise you, as she said that, she kind of got up. If ever I was afraid, I began to be afraid. <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? What? What's going on right now? <laughs> Yo, I didn't know what to say. And literally, all I said was, "The Lord rebuke you." <laughs> That's all I could say. <laughs> Yo, it looked like somebody shot the lady with a shotgun, and she fell in her chair. Why did I tell you that story? Yo, know, every single night after that, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't be in my room in a dark room alone. I couldn't anything. I any any room dark? Nah, I can't do that. By my own self, I can barely even sleep. My mind is troubled just living in constant fear until I recognized how in the world am I to live my life? Like if I live my life in constant fear and then I realized Satan really just tries to use fear as access to us. Really, Satan just tries to use fear as access. And I'm like, yo, as long as I'm afraid, and as long as I'm like, you know, thinking about this, I literally will be, a, my life will not be normal because my life is not normal and I can't even sleep. I can't even go to the bathroom if it's dark, I have to turn on every single light just so I can walk through. Like, like what is this? Until I'm just like, honestly, let me break this down. Let me break this down. You know, I'm in my room and this room is not a place, you know, something happened in my room where I, I was about to quit right before I quit soccer. I was kind of on the fence. Um, uh, I had a dream. This is close to what just happened with the whole demon thing. I had a dream where my whole dream went pitch black and literally a hand came out of nowhere and started writing and said, God has power, but I have power too. God has people, but I have people too. They do rituals for me and I give them the things of this world. And literally in that, I'm like, I kind of like laugh. like, And I said, Christ offers eternal life. And when I said that, I tried to get up out of my bed and I could not move. I couldn't move. I'm like, I tried to say the name of Jesus. Every time I tried to say Jesus, my tongue would roar. You guys think I'm joking. My tongue would roar until I had to just stay in my bed and, and just pray. And after I prayed, I'm like, in the name of Jesus. And I jumped out of my bed. After those two things happened, I was paralyzed with fear. Wake up in the middle of the night, sweat, my body full of sweat. Mind is troubled. Until literally I just had to look at it like, yo, okay, either one, need to sleep in another room. Two, this, whole, this, this ministry, one, I don't believe that the way that we're doing things is, is righteous. I don't see Jesus holding no deliverance, deliverance for 10 hours in the room say, saying, saying he's reading and, and singing and, and this. Nah, there's no talking to the demon and then having, nah, nah. Every, all, my mind does not, I need to fill my mind with the word of God and with Christ's power, not the devil's power. I need to magnify what Christ can do and is doing in my life. I need to literally look at this in this way. I began to sleep downstairs. You know, I made my brother and his wife sleep in my room. I began to sleep on the couch, you know, and just take myself away from all those types of thoughts and, and step by step, step by step. And really just try to an, an analyze this fear in a practical way. Today, pitch black has no faith. I'm not phased by it in any way. I actually don't even like to sleep in a room that's not dark. Darkness is not some darkness. Darkness is almost something I even embrace. Sometimes I shower in the dark, literally. I'll turn off the lights, I'll put some music on, and I just shower in the dark. And really, guys, like what, like when you're afraid, it's okay. But take yourself out of yourself and, and don't make Satan paralyze you. Don't. Because if Satan is powerful, God is more powerful. And in God's power, Satan's power is as a nothing. It says nothing. Let's go to question. No, 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 help you, help you. Sorry, sorry, somebody said something. No, I, think that it, I think that in Jonah's situation, man, you know, the more the more we run, 
hey, this work is of God. And guess what? Diamond, if God is calling you, you can run all you want. You can run all you want. I'm not saying, I'm just using as an example, you know. But you can run all you want, you know. Surely goodness and mercy will run you down. It'll run you down. It'll run you down. You know, it'll run you down. And guess what? Enough of us are running from God or not doing the things he's called us to. And if God is the type of person to say, all right, you're going to run away. I'm going to leave you to your, leave you be. None of us will be working for God right now. You know, and so, yeah, honestly, th these things are not read. Embrace, embrace the, the feelings of inadequacy. Embrace the fear. Embrace the, you know, the, the, the uncertainty. Embrace it and just take your eyes off of yourself. Jesus is not afraid. So if you're afraid, stop looking to yourself and look to him. David in the Bible says, what times I'm afraid, I will trust in you. So being afraid is not the problem. Being afraid and not trusting in God is the problem. And so say like David, look it up, Google that one. Sorry, I don't know exactly where it is, but David in the Bible, he says, what times when I am afraid, I will trust in you. And that's really what the motive is. Real quick, question number two. I know we're going to have to end soon. I actually don't even know when we're supposed to end. We're just going to hop on and have this kind of discussion. But Katie, I just shoot me a private message and I'll shut up on whenever. But question number two, there are times where I feel I'm too unworthy to serve God in church. How should I combat this? You probably are unworthy to serve God in church. You probably are. What you thought this was about you? <laughs> this, you thought this is about you. You thought you were chosen because... Let me show you something God says about Israel in the Bible. I actually have to Google it. Forgive me, because I, I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, forgive me. Let me Google this real quick. Um, Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. Deuteronomy 7. This is just something that God just dropped in me that Hopefully, we'll make this point more clear. Um, and so watch this now. Um, and verse number six. <laughs> My verse number six. To the Lord, please be with us in Jesus' name, amen. Deuteronomy 7, verse number six. We're going to read it real quick. Katie, Ann, shoot me that message. Let me know and I should be quiet. Verse number six. It says, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. Okay. The Lord thy God hath chosen you to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth, the Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you are more in number than any people. For you're the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because you would keep the oath which he sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The Lord didn't choose us because there is something in and of ourselves. The Lord chose us in spite of ourselves. God chooses us for his sake, not for ours. It's not because of me. It's not because of you. It's because of him. This is his decision. And I really pray in the depths of my soul that, that we wouldn't look to our record. We wouldn't look to our past. We wouldn't look to our skill set. We wouldn't look to our abilities but that we would look to Jesus and ask ourselves, as Christ asked Moses, what is in my hand? And simply have faith that God can put life in that thing that's in my hand, even to the extent that it'll make me afraid. Like God, God will blow my mind with myself. Let me show you a text real quick in Ephesians 3, real quick, real quick. Ephesians 3, then we'll go on to the next question. Ephesians 3, powerful, powerful verse um, that blows my mind to this day. But watch, watch, watch this. So Ephesians 3 and verse number 16. Ephesians 3 and verse number 16. Ephesians 3, verse number 16. Then we'll move on. We'll move on. I was told that we already answered verse number, first number, question number five. So we just have three and four to, to go through. Um, so Ephesians 3 and verse number 16. Watch what it says. So that P Paul is praying that God would grant you, the church, all of us, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, that Christ 
would dwell in our hearts by faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able, watch this, to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of God which passes knowledge. How do we know something that passes knowing? How do we know something that passes knowledge? That you might be full of the fullness of God. Verse 20, watch it, it says now. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or even think. How? According to the power that works in us. Don't skip that part. The power is working in you. The power is working in you. The end. Like the end. Like the end. Like this is spiritual. This is not an earthly thing. It's spiritual. The Bible says the carnal man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He can't receive them. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. This is spiritual. The Bible literally said the power is working in you. Where do you think Star Wars got that from? Satan is always trying to bite God. The power is working in you. How do you, re how do you get on your knees and say a prayer and read that verse? And walk away and think that you don't you do not have all that you need. How? You know, my mind, I started a, a little blog where I write um every night, maybe three to five minute reads. You guys should check that out. It's everything hyphen drew.com. Check that out. And really, one of the reasons why I started with it is because I recognize that I just have my devotion. And I easily just kind of get up and just, okay, I'm done my devotion. And like, I'm so quick to like do whatever else I'm doing. And I try to pray and, and I pray for sure. But like, I want to engage with God more. And so I said, you know what? Writing would be a good way to kind of reflect and kind of like, just take time with my thoughts and with, with, with God. You know, like, just chill, just chill. I don't want to say that we let go of the arm of God too soon. And so anyways, I'm just like, you know what? All right, let me just start, start to write. And then writing, um, my thoughts on certain things become so clear. And the idea of overcoming temptation is so important to me. Like, I love to study it and think about it. And I failed many times at trying to overcome temptation. So I always try to think like, Lord, what? like, why? Like, what's wrong with me? And here's the powerful thing. I used to think that I wasn't strong or I wasn't this. I wasn't that. God, please give me strength. Okay, let's say I, I want to eat this chocolate cake or something, you know? And I know I'm not supposed to be eating this chocolate cake. God, give me that strength. And I just end up eating the chocolate cake. And then what do I tell myself? Man, I'm not that disciplined. Man, I don't have that strength yet. Man, I need to continue climbing Jacob's ladder. Whatever. Whatever progressive thing we like to tell ourselves. Until I realized one time, I am such a liar. Even to myself. Because guess what? When I pray, God... Please give me the strength to overcome this temptation. Does God, not, does God not give it to me? Does he say, no, nah, you're not ready for this kind of strength yet. I'm not trying to make you overcome that temptation yet. Like, what does God actually say? Nah, you're not ready for the spirit that, I, that I'm going to give you right now. You're not ready for it. Like, is, that, is God actually saying that? Okay, not. Nah. Okay, fine. I'm not as disciplined. or I, I'm not strong enough, we like to tell ourselves. Okay, so God gave us strength, but not enough strength to overcome the temptation? What in the world? Like, that doesn't even make sense. I'm not that strong. I'm not strong enough. Okay, so God just gave me a whole bunch of strength, but he gave me not enough? That doesn't make sense. Until I realized every single temptation I find myself in, when I ask God for strength, he gives me the strength. He gives me more than enough that I need to overcome. And when I sin, when I don't overcome, you know what I do? I literally say to God, God, thank you for the offer. I know that I just asked, but you already know I'm crazy. I actually don't want that right now. I don't want the strength because I want to sin. 
And that's all that it is. It's not, God, please give me strength. Please give me strength. God's given you strength, but then he didn't give you enough, so you fall into temptation. Nah. No. God gives you the strength, and you accept it, and it's enough, or you put it away. The end. God says, hey, I want you to speak for me. Hey, I want you to do this for me. God, no, please, please. God, no. The power is working in you. The end. The end. And guess what? With that same power, you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. The end. It's not that complicated. It really doesn't have to be glossed up and dressed up any more than that. Take your Bible, get on your knees and ask yourself, do I believe this? If you don't say, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. God, increase my faith. The end. The end. Some of us want the Bible to be deeper than it is. Maybe we want it to, to, I don't know. The power works in us, man. The power works in us. The power in us. Like it's in you. There's no excuse. Like there is no excuse. None, not one. You are not enough, but with Christ, you're more than enough. You're stupid with Christ, you're wise. You're weak with Christ, you're strong. You know what's funny? I did a word search on the word worthy before this. And the word worthy just means enough. Enough. The word worthy is sometimes translated as many, abundance. You know, like, oh, hey, I don't have enough. It's, I don't, what I have is not worthy. But if I have enough, if I have many, it's also translated as long, not short. And so my abilities, if I'm worthy, I have enough. If I'm worthy, I, I have length. I have depth. I have breadth. I have the love of Christ. And my worthiness doesn't come from me. It comes from God. With Christ, I am enough. With Christ, I am worthy. Real quick, real quick, real quick. Um, sorry if you guys are getting annoyed at my voice. Number three, I feel like I'm unco- I feel like I'm comfortable in my unworthiness. I like the motivation to feel that I can come to God. I feel like I'm comfortable in my unworthiness. Man. This is so crazy because a lot of people feel this way um but i think a lot of people feel this way because of what we've been talking about all this time their eyes are fixed on themselves and and as i went through these questions i realized that the answer was the same you know it's the same man it's the same You know, it's the same. When you take your eyes off of self. Let's wind down. Come to Romans 5 real quick. Real quick, real quick. Come to Romans 5 as we wind down. Romans 5. I remember when I felt unworthy and I read Romans 5 once. And I'll share this till the day I die because here's a time where, where the Bible, where God literally spoke to me and I started shedding a tear. Like, Literally, the Bible spoke to me and made me produce tears. That blows my mind. And I remember just feeling so far from God, so unworthy. And I cracked open my Bible and I read Romans 5. And I felt like Jesus himself sat beside me in my car and explained this verse to me. And here's what it says. Here's what it says in Romans chapter 5. Um, in verse number 6, it says, When you are without strength, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Real quick, guys. In Ephesians 3, how did it say we were strengthened? Anybody? Do you guys remember? Strengthened by his, in the inner man, by his what? How are we strengthened? Does anybody remember? We just read in Ephesians 3. How are we strengthened? Anyone? The scripture says we were strengthened by his, ooh, looks like somebody's flipping to it. All right. We are strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. Right. 
in the inner man. And so we're strengthened by his spirit in the inner man, right? Okay. Um, if Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 says, when we were without strength and we are strengthened by God's spirit, when we're without strength, it means we're void of God's spirit. So adjective, adjective number one or descriptive number one, we, are without, we were without God's spirit completely. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Not only were we without his spirit, we were ungodly. Ungodly. I see that question real quick on my answer. Um, verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. All that verse is saying is, if there's somebody good, someone might die for you. If there's somebody bad, nobody's going to die for them. That's the idea in the text. Good person, yo, a man might die for that person. A bad person, ain't nobody going to die for that person. No. No. Verse number eight. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. So not only were we without God's spirit, not only were we ungodly, we are also sinners. Verse number 10. Notice what it says. It says, for if when we were enemies... Not only were we without God's spirit, not only were we sinners, not only were we ungodly, we were God's enemies. Now, what did he do for us? Verse number eight, he commended his love towards us. When we were these things, he died for us. Now that he died for us, what happens? Well, well, look at verse number... um, Look at verse number 10. For if when we are enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son, now much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now, if we used to be enemies, now that we're reconciled, what are we now? Friends. Friends. If we used to be sinners, now that we're reconciled, what are we now? Righteous. If we used to be ungodly, what are we now in his sight after his death? Godly in his sight. Because of Christ. Now, watch this. If Christ would do the most for you, such as die for you, he did that for you, not when you were his friend, but when you were his enemy. And the scripture tells us in verse 7 that we would do more for our friends than we would for our enemies. And so if Jesus died for you, when you are his enemy, what will he do for you now that you're his friend? Deep, which is why the scripture says in verse number eight, the last four words, Christ died for us. Verse number nine, much more than? What? Christ died for us is not period, end of story. No, nah, the gospel does not stop as Christ died for us, the end. We're intelligent in the Bible. We know that, that when the high priest makes a sacrifice, he, he uses that same blood and ministers with that blood in the temple. And that's Bible. That's sanctuary. And so Jesus died for us, yes, but he takes that very same blood and he ministers for us. My question to you, if God died for you and converted you from an enemy to a friend, now that he lives for you, what can stand in your way? This is, why Paul, this is why Paul himself says, how shall he not with Christ freely give us all things? You proof text, study that phrase, all things. So watch, Jesus died for me. Paul is saying, if Christ died for me, if God gave his son to die for me, how shall he not also with Christ freely give me all things? Okay, what are those all things? Come to Philippians 4. I can now do all things because Christ gives me strength. Come on. But guess what? When did he do that for me? Real quick, Proverbs 10, Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, let me adjust the comment in the chat real quick. Proverbs 10. Look at this verse real quick. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, Proverbs 10. And then we're going we're gonna to look at that question in the chat. 
Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10. And verse number 20. Proverbs 10 and verse number 20. And watch what it says. The tongue of the just is as choice silver. The heart of the wicked is of little worth. Mercy. Are, were our hearts wicked? Come on, come on, guys. We all know Jeremiah, what Jeremiah says. We all know what we just read in Romans 5. Are our hearts wicked? Yes. That, mean, that means it's of little worth. That means a man's going to look at it and be like, what is that? What is that? Well, you know how much Christ prayed for, paid for that heart? How much did Christ pay for something that seemed to be of little worth? Man paid for his life. And you know what the powerful thing about worth is? Something may be in and of itself not worth a lot. In and of itself not worth a lot. But its worth can be transformed based upon whose possession it's in. Its worth can be transformed based upon how much someone is willing to pay. Case in point, you have a piece of cloth of a jersey, a soccer jersey, right? If I have a soccer jersey, what is this? If the same soccer jersey belonged to Lionel Messi, it's the same thing. But when it switches, when, when the possession changes from one person to another, all, all of a sudden its worth grows exponentially. All of a sudden, somebody else willing to pay so much more for it. And so I think the answer to the question in the chat is, is I don't know if it's possible, man, to be in love with Jesus and to want to stay stuck in that feeling. Tell me what you guys think, man. Tell me what you think. I don't think, I think that one of the problems are we grew up in church and we're just church cultured in a rigid structural way, but we don't have that living fire that comes from a genuine connection with God and of ourselves. We just grew up in the faith. And that was me. I just grew up going to Adventist school and I go to church, but I'm out here doing things that I wouldn't even want to mention to you guys right after church or before. And it's just like I grew up, I grew up, I went to Adventist school. Okay, go to Adventist church. Okay, okay, okay. And it's like, do I, do I really like, am I in love with Christ, man? But what do you guys think, though? Do you guys honestly think, this is my question to you, do you honestly think that I can love a woman? I can be in love with a woman and not want to do anything with and for and to her? I'm going to just be in love with a woman. I'm going to be with my wife. We're going to be chilling, you know, nighttime. And every single night, I don't want to touch my wife. I'm going to pass by a nice gift, you know, at, at a whatever. And I'm not going to feel stimulated. Like, yo, let me buy this for my wife. I'm not going to feel like that to me doesn't make sense. That just to me, me, you, I don't know if you fell out of love, you need counseling, something. Or simply, you need to be educated on how to love. And that's the only other thing, guys. And I think love is a, is, is, is a school. Is a school where you teach somebody how to love. I was about to sing a secular song, but let me not desecrate God's, God's holy Sabbath day. <laughs> but the fact that the man have mercy on me, have mercy on me. This is, uh, this is my, my back in the day days. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, is it's still a principle, right? We must be taught how to love. I have to teach you how to love me and you have to teach me how to love you. Hey, how can I love you? What do you like? Do you like gifts? Do you like words of affirmation? Do you like whatever? Like, how does that work? And guess what? If I genuinely love you, I'm going to do that. And so the thing is, I don't think that somebody can care about loving God and see how God wants us to love him. God also is a person and he wants to be loved in a particular way. And if we ask God, God, how do you want to be loved? And God says, yo, yes, my daughter, my son, I thought you'd never ask. This is how, how I want to be loved. It's in the 66, literally. 
Here it is. And you read it and you say, this is how God, one of the ways I want to be loved, I want to see naturally that you talk about me. If I'm in a relationship with a person and I don't naturally want to talk, I don't naturally want to talk about this person I'm with to my friends. Like that don't even make sense to me. Like everybody knows the feeling of just talking to someone and literally not being able to shut up. Y'all are looking at me like, like you guys are bathed in olive oil or too righteous for this conversation or something. I'm like, is it facts or is it not facts? It's facts. You know, how then do we fall in love with Christ and not want to talk about <laughs> Christ? How then do, Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, no sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in him a desire to make him known to others. She says, every person is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. A missionary. You know, and so to me, it's like, that where we got to start is just really being real with yourself. God, I don't love you like I think I love you. I'm just, maybe you're afraid of going to hell. Maybe you want the blessings that he has to offer. But like, you know, Paul says something to the church. I think it was the Corinthian church. And he said, guys, I don't want yours. I want you. And I think a lot of our problems is, my problem, is that we want what is God's, but we don't want God. God, I want your blessings. I don't know if I want you, though. This is in the Bible. But Balaam, you know what Balaam said? (laughs) God tells Balaam, hey, this is what I want you to do. Balaam does the opposite. Balaam literally tries to curse God's people. And you you know what God says? You know what Balaam says? The man says, after living an unrighteous life, let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. How are you going to live the life of the unrighteous and die the death of the righteous? That not make no sense. It does not make any sense. It just doesn't work like that. It doesn't. And so here's my thing, man. I really think that a lot of times we want what's God's and we don't want him. And that's okay. God is able to bear that. But in the long run, it's actually not okay. And, and we, we don't get, we need to talk to ourselves a lot more hard. And just be honest, man. You can only come to God in your honesty. He sees you in your most naked and raw self. I recognize that sometimes I don't sin because I don't want the consequences. But I have to ask myself, am I actually in love with Jesus? Sometimes I don't sin because I only want the blessings. But like, do I want God though? And really, you get tested when stuff doesn't go your way. Why do you go through the valleys and through the fire and through the storm? And you've been faithful. And you're tested. And you ask yourself, man, was I in it for Christ or was I in it for what? And ask yourself, man, do you love Jesus or do you love what Jesus has or can give? And I think that if you do, then you can ask him. You can say, Christ, I honestly think I love you, but I just, I just don't know, God. I, I just don't. I just feel like I don't want to do anything, you know? And then the next time you ask, God to do something for you, hold your tongue. Why are you asking God to do stuff for you if you're not trying to do stuff for him? Well, because he loves you and you know that because he loves you, he'll do it. Okay, you love him, okay, you do it too. We can do it, man. And so just to wrap up before we get into, I guess the last couple of questions. Hey, everybody has something to do. Everyone, especially in this generation, man, like, and I don't know what it is. I wish that I had the wisdom to to know what everybody could and should do, but I think everybody has some something to do. And I remember when I wanted to like work for God. I'm like, God, how am I going to do this? And I'm just like, okay, maybe I'll I'll preach in churches. I'm like, okay, I'll preach in churches. Okay, cool. Uh, How do we do that? How do, how, does, how do we go about doing that? 
you know, and I, I have never asked someone, hey, can I preach in your church? Like, no, no. And so how, how does that even happen? I said, you know what? If I wait for someone to give me an opportunity to work for my God, I may not ever do it. You know what? Let me start up a little YouTube channel. 50 million reasons why I don't want to start it. Honestly, my head looks like weird. I look at myself in the camera and my head looks like lopsided or something. I don't know what's wrong with my head top. Literally, I turn on the camera. I look at myself. I'm like, why do I look like an idiot? I promise you. And for the, for, for the first couple of months, I did not have any YouTube channel because I simply thought I looked crazy on camera. My teeth are kind of crooked down here. My head, my head top is kind of like, you know, and my eyes are on myself. And it's actually interesting that at my brother's wedding, the videographer, he, you know, did like the video for my brother's wedding. And after we were watching my brother's wedding videos, whatever, and I looked at myself in the, in the camera, I'm like, yo, I actually don't look like my head doesn't look lopsided, <laughs> you know? And I literally called the same guy and in my first videos, I wore the same thing. And all of my initial videos on my YouTube channel are literally me wearing a black suit. And it's with the same guy that recorded at my brother's wedding. And, and literally, I'm just like, you know what? Let me just try. Let me just try. Let me just try. You know, however, however this can happen, I have to go for it. I have to. What are your excuses, man? What? I said to God, I'm like, all right, God, you know, I realized I didn't have a camera. I'm like, Lord, I don't have a camera. The same day, you guys think I'm joking. The same day I prayed to God, God, I don't even have a camera to film by myself. A man called me. He said, yo, Andrew, can you come to my house? I said, I don't even know. Like he went to my high school a long time ago. Um, and I, like, I didn't really talk to him. The man's just like, yo, can you just come to my house? I'm like, all right. Okay. Um, I went to the man's house. The man had a video camera for me. And the man said he bought some video, video editing software, Final Cut Pro, $300. He's like, go on and install it on your computer. We will have no excuse. I'm not a writer. I can't write. I don't, I don't think I'm this prolific writer. I'm like, you know what? Let me start a little blog. And my measure of success is not how much people watch the videos, how much people read the blog. I could care less. My measure of success is, am I consistent? The end. God doesn't need, to, need me to be some big time YouTuber, big time blogger to use me. He just needs me to be available. And that's it. And I just do the little that I can do with consistency. What can you do, even if it's little, with consistency? There's something. If there's nothing, you're a liar. You can do something, even if it's a little, with consistency. Um, the last question I'm going to ask you guys in your spare time, I'm going to show you guys what I do. Um, I'm, I'm sharing my screen right now. The way that I study the Bible is I'll just put the word bold, and you put a little asterisk. And this asterisk, what it does is, is it shows you not just the word bold, but it also shows you boldly, boldness, all of that. That's what this little asterisk does. And as you take this word bold, you go through the verses. And if I was studying for this, okay, God, how can I answer this question? Teach me about what it looks like to be bold in the word of God. But honestly, the be the, as I was searching through these, the best answer, answer I can come to is in 1 John 4. And so let's click to, click on this, okay? It mentions boldness. 1 John 4, let me see some context here. 1 John 4, okay, verse number 17. Let's give, let's give some more context and go to verse number 15. Okay, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you confess that Jesus is the Son of God? Yeah. God dwells in you, and you dwell in God. And we have known and believed that the love that God has to us, God is love. And he that dwells in love, dwells in God, and God in him. Herein, in this, our love is made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There's no fear in love, 
but perfect love casts out all fear because fear is torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he's lying for he that loves his brother whom he sees or he, he, he that doesn't love his brother whom he sees, how can he love God whom he doesn't see? And this commandment we have from him that he who loveth God love his brother also. And so what does it mean to come boldly to the throne of God? I think coming boldly to the throne of God also means to be bold in the, in the day of judgment, what we just read in 1 John 4. What does that look like? Well, we can be bold when we confess that Jesus is the Son of God and we have that love in our hearts. Do you have love for other people? Do you have genuine love for other people? When other people fail you, when other people make mistakes, when other people curse you and row you and all these things, how do you feel? Is your posture a posture of love? If that's your posture to them, if your posture is a posture of love, you have the right to be bought before the throne of grace. Because guess what? You know that you yourself are a sinner. You know you've made mistakes. But guess what? The same love you've manifested to, to others, God will manifest to you. When you pray the Lord's Prayer, Lord, forgive us of our debts, you know, as we forgive those that are indebted to us, you can have boldness. When your posture is to others, what the Bible says God's posture is to you, you can have boldness. And always remember, guys, it is not about you. Take your eyes off of you and put your eyes on Jesus. I really want to see. Um, I really want to see, man, um, like, what can we do for God? You know, what can we do? What can we do? I don't know if we want to have a short little Q&A. Um, hopefully I answer these questions. Hopefully I didn't talk too much. Hopefully people don't annoy my voice. Hopefully um, what I said, what God is trying to communicate. Um, I, hopefully I said what God was trying to communicate. Hopefully these things can stimulate us to search the Bible a little more deeply. Hopefully we can see that it's not all that complex. That it's simple. And while it may not be easy, guys, it's very simple. It's very simple. You know, very simple. Any questions, Kadian? Any anything? And I think you've covered it all. I don't know if anyone wanted to chime in with one last thing before we do kind of wrap it up. Um, but I didn't want to say thank you, Andrew. I mean, we covered a lot. And for this question, um, am I too unworthy to come to God? The plain answer is no. You know, as you clearly told us what worth meant it means enough and god mm. thought it, that we are enough the fact mm. that we you know the lost the lost sheep you know he left the 99 to find the one so you are enough for, um for god um he laid down his life for all of us and we should just cling on to that knowing that we are worthy to come boldly before the throne of god um and when we are feeling in these situations where we feel like we're not enough god reminds us um you are enough <laughs> just always remember that and Again, thank you. And if anyone wants to hear more from Andrew, he has his YouTube channel, The Truth TV. Um, and I don't know if you want to share this, um, Andrew, about your Bible study that you do. Don't know if you want to open it up. Um, but he does do a Bible study Friday evenings um, and stuff like that. And it's really, again, we break it down just like we did today. Um, but again, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And to everyone listening, let us cling on he put it in the chat cool just really 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 cling on to the promises that are in the word of god he he's just awesome he really is and just to know that he thought enough of us is just a powerful thought 